Hello everybody, Andrew here, Polo Reef. We have a special treat for you and a special panel with no specific agenda or topics to talk about. So it's gonna flow pretty smoothly and I'm gonna let them all introduce themselves. Bob Stark from uh, ESV Aquarium Products. Make, uh, make a lot of supplements you guys probably know about and I'm really happy to be here. Thanks, Bob. Jonathan Hale, Country Critters, pet store in New York and help build this tank. <laughs> Joe Muscat, Two Sicaros, part of Polo Reef, happy to be here. Craig Bingman, I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. I'm a biochemist, I keep aquariums. Mike Paletta, I'm independent contractor, but I write for reef builders and basically anyone else that's out there. Mike, I'm gonna <laughs> let you lead the first, or the first sort of topics. So it, it's been a great day for sharing information. That's one of the things that all of us, particularly old guys, have been sharing forever. Before the internet and before social media, we used to talk to one another and we used to uh, constantly share our information with that. So this is another opportunity to do that. And that's one of the things I appreciate about Andrew is that he helped us to help educate and keep people excited and interested in the hobby. And one of the topics that we talked about a lot this morning is basically what's old is new. That is whenever we all started off, the hobby was much simpler in that we had calc Vosser, we had metal halide lights, we had sea swirl pumps moving the water around and our corals did fine. Now it's gotten much more complicated. So in, in terms of what's old is new again, one of the hot topics, which amazes me, is it's not a forgotten topic, but it's a neglected topic is pH and why people are chasing pH. From my standpoint, it basically comes from one article or one video done by Bulk Reef Supply that showed that they had faster growth when they had higher pH. Now, we've all been in the hobby for a long time. Do you have anything to add to whether you have seen higher pH increased growth? You think high pH is better? You think, what? and what do you consider higher pH? So I'll let you, we'll start with Bob because he always likes to go first. Well, I think going back along with you guys, Craig and, and Mike and, uh, Basically, this hobby started with mostly just Kalklosser. So those tanks really did run at a high pH. And the alkalinity was always like an issue. We always had to once in a while add a buffer or something to, to bring up the alkalinity. Uh, and those tanks did well, great coral and algae. Um, but then we two-part came out, calcium reactors came out, and people were able to go up in their alkalinity a little easier and growth increased. That's my memory of it. Things that seem to do better. Uh, so I think when we just talk about pH, we're only talking about one element of a much more complicated thing, which is the saturation state, calcium carbonate, and coral's ability to, uh, to calcify. And all of these, there's many players in that, and there's nobody that I can think of that can explain it better than Craig, so. <laughs> calcium carbonate saturation <laughs> state and, Craig, and Craig, alkaline. Craig, Craig is the king of that yes. subject. Yes. Yes. So um, thinking back to those times, we had a hard time evaporating enough water from our aquariums to support calcification, right? And there's a, there's, there's an article about that from a long time ago. Right. Um, and if you don't evaporate enough Water. Weren't people blowing to... fans on top of the tanks? Oh, absolutely, increases? absolutely. Oh, yeah. that, <laughs> I sort of remember doing that. Well, that was, that was to cool it from the halides and to increase that right. vaporation. Right. You gotta and, for experimenting with slurry, yeah. experimenting and with concentrate. Then you'd put in super oh, yeah. saturated wasn't calcium. Right, hydroxide. okay, I remember those. I and that was, that. Yeah. that was always a little bit dangerous, right? right? Oh, yeah. And so um, I think part of what happened was that there are a lot of people who were not able to really hit a reasonable alkalinity target um, that we're suddenly able to when the calcium carbonate CO2 right. reactors right. and the balanced two-part supplements came along. And so of course, growth increased, right? But I think all of the things being equal, and they're usually not, right? Mm. Um, if you bump up pH, you a few things might happen. Will you increase growth? I'm not sure. Um, I think that you do, increase the advantage that calcifying organisms have over bad algae, because they're able to, ex the carbon dioxide concentration in the aquarium will go down as pH goes up, right? So if you're a, a green algae, you want to use CO2. 
if you're a coral analogy or a coral, you can use bicarbonate, right? right? And so you you give the I'll advantage compete. to those to yeah, those I'll systems, right. and that's what you what what you're trying to grow, right? right? On right. on the substrate. So um, I I think it's like all things are not always equal, right? right? And so what happened for one group when the two part and the CO2 reactors came along didn't necessarily happen for everyone because there were some people who were evaporating enough water and right. making a perfectly good go of it with, with lime they water. They were getting water. to that alkalinity yeah, level. Right. By the way, and, and the back in those days, did they, did they have dosers like we have today? They, no, they had uh, kind they of did, like a... What, 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 what were you dripping they with? They did like, have peristaltic, like peristaltic pumps. Yeah, you do peristaltic pal, pumps and IV that bags. Was a thing. Chemical dosing pump right. too. So yeah. the important point about bicarbonate is when you raise the alkalinity at a given pH, you could go up and carbonate, but then it kind of stops, and then everything else is just increased bicarbonate, pretty much, right? So you're increasing the concentration of inorganic carbon at a higher alkalinity in general? Yes. So, and if you're increasing bicarbonate, I think there's studies that show cor that's to the benefit of the coral because the concentration of the bicarbonate's higher. It's a, so it's even hard for scientists to like decompose this. Um, and I think that when they've when they've looked at it, bicarbonate tends to be a very important parameter in terms of right. growth. Right. All right, so what, it's also, like what, adding extra CO2. What, what does the anecdotal evidence suggest, um, store owner, or what you got when you hear or see in systems? Let, let's 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 do it that way. A comment on that? Yeah, yes. Yeah. A lot of people have seen that video and are trying to chase this pH number, especially on a new tank with a low coral population and low bio load and having a lot of other issues from trying to chase these numbers instead of just, you know, oh, I'm dumping in calc and I'm pH is 8.5, but, you know, and then they're ending up, and they're ending up with, you know, sand beds calcifying right. and things. The just be, of like it, yeah, because they're just chasing numbers and not yeah. trying to, you know, it might be more of an advanced or a more seasoned tank thing rather than starting off that way for some people. And I think people are confusing that with, you know, seeing this video that the pH is so important. Yeah, I think for new tanks, they're really prone to like make concrete basically yeah. until everything gets fouled out with organics and there's less opportunities to nucleate, you know, calcium carbonate crystals to like lock everything together. Right. So that's yeah. like, we do get like probably one person a week that's has that happen because they watched the video and went out and did this without. And are they checking out so, the linen? Uh, uh, no. Wait, they come, they 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 come to your store. Yeah, that, that my sand bed's a rock, what happened? So the, well, what are you doing? Well, I remember those days. Yeah. The statement. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. In because two, they watched the BRS video? Yeah, and they went out and they ordered calc. And That's one of the most popular things. videos is high pH leads. Yeah. Did yeah. they update the that, road. though, and sh reverse it a little and say, well, so, the alkalinity so, is important? If you're just starting out, shouldn't you be alkalinity concentrating the on the pH. They had them growing your different coral yeah. some same with, as opposed to bar. some sort of like a race, right? It's like everybody wants to go faster. Right, but it, right. Right. Whatever. What, the feedback I'm getting is everybody's like, oh, well, if this is what they said is important in this. And I was like, well, you know, let's start with some fundamentals of calcium and alkalinity and not just what jump into it. Well, the, the talking about the fundamentals of calc phosphor for these new people that are getting into it, starting to use it, we know that calc phosphor precipitates out phosphate. Doesn't it also precipitate some trace elements like fluoride and some other things as well that may be <clears throat> somewhat detrimental? So um, are you talking about mi mixing lime water? When you're mixing water? lime water and you're dripping it into the tank, when that hits the water, is it causing other things to precipitate out, like fluoride or other trace elements? I don't think that it would probably do very much with fluoride. Theoretically, I mean, if you have high, you can make calcium fluoride as an insoluble mineral that you find in the Earth's crust, right? So that's, but I don't think that that, that really happens. I think the little um, pulse of precipitate that you see is mainly um, calcium carbonate fines and maybe a little bit of magnesium hydroxide, which goes back in the water pretty quickly. Um, it will definitely, so I don't know that it directly precipitates phosphate in an aquarium when you drip it in, 
but it definitely seems to increase the poise of the system to export phosphate. So I think it makes your skimmer work a little bit better and you get rid of phosphate that way. It's like lime water does all these little pushes and most of them are in the direction that you want them to go. Um, so I think incorporating some lime water into uh, aquarium husbandry is probably in the right direction. And I think the top shelf and and they figured it out using it, the farmers that Grow right. corals. To, yeah, there's a like, lot like of this is not a, a like uh, uh, this is not a secret subject anymore. Right. No, but, but a but, lot <laughs> of two, a lot of my two part goes to farms that are using cow. No, I get and it. And then just using the two part to fill in right. where yeah. they yeah. can't get right. it. Right. And well, just well, to circle that's back how, really quick. That's, that was a use case for it early on. Right. Was yeah. and it was very successful. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, I tried to so. formulate the bionic to give you a big pH push for people who didn't want to use cow, and you could kind of get away with it. But if you really want to get to that higher pH and sweet spot, and plus calcoasser is cheap. Right, but when you say that you starting but, but out. But I just, just to go back to the chasing pH and alkalinity, right. one problem with that also is it's you really have to have an accurate calibrated pH probe yeah. to do that. Don't get And most <laughs> people fall way short on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. An alkalinity I'm, I'm, I'm kit is much more reliable. The, the, yeah, the yeah. apex So you can get more is not, there's no way that, that, that thing results works, by checking right. your alkalinity and dosing bro. according to alkalinity. Yeah. Sally, this hub is still pH lacking pH. a good That's pH system and a good calibration system. I mean, you literally have to calibrate every time you're gonna use pH because it falls out of whack. I know. So quickly. Right. So there's a fundamental risk there, I think. With so pH budget. probes are usually okay for a few months. And then if they've been in continuous duty, they'll start to flake out. You have to calibrate them. So I clean them. It also basically, where, yeah. they're, where they're located. If you bio find that you have to calibrate your pH electrode like once, that's a suggestion that it may be towards the end of its life. It should really hold in salt water for a long time. Really? Now the freshwater people have a much harder time because the, the salt constant, the ionic strength of their systems is much lower. So the electrolyte in the pH electrode goes away faster and they chew through pH electrodes much faster than reef people do. And, and they are in some cases controlling pH yes. carbon dioxide. Yes. So they kind of need that to work pretty right. well. Right. So I wanted to say something about carbon dioxide there right. because you know pH and carbon dioxide are uh, inversely related in seawater. So if you have high carbon dioxide in your house, if you will have pH. a low system pH usually. Mm -hmm. I remember um, that visit and, to Greg Scheimer. Uh, <laughs> uh, exactly, that right? We were thing. all together yeah, and, right. and Greg was, there was probably what, 10, 12, 15 people down in Greg's basement. There's a little basement with a 500 gallon tank and right. the pH starts dropping. And the pH and starts freaks. plummeting and he's he's like concerned that someone's like poured something mm -hmm. into, his, into his tanks, right? To sabotage them. And I'm like, I'm like looking at the volume of the room and all the people respiring. I'm like, I think it's probably carbon dioxide from all of us. Right. And I went back and I'm like, yeah, definitely the, the carbon dioxide constant. This was a long time ago, so we didn't have carbon dioxide. I think he installed a, a ventilation system after that. Though. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, that's what maybe like we should all be that. thinking about right. doing if yeah. we have low depressed system pH, is maybe ventilating the house, getting rid of that carbon dioxide. Because the other thing that's happened is that we've built houses much more tightly, yeah. yep. and they hang yeah. on to CO2. More. Yeah, well, you know, the new homes nowadays, they're forcing us to put in air exchangers. Yeah. So that will help and much to yeah. Well, the the tight house means everything else built up in there. Right. All the stuff but they run airline paint. tubing to the outside so for, yeah. for for the skimmer. For, for to the draw skimmer. That is a big. That's a, that's another one. Yep. No, but I that, do, to I, me, that's like what happens if something sprayed outside. Yeah. I, 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 or or the hole. spring when the pollen and everything yeah. else yeah. comes in. Yeah. My question is, <clears throat> a reefer coming into the hobby. You know, we're talking about cockwasser and pH yep. and right. all of this. Should he be or you know should starting be out? <laughs> <laughs> he should be running out the door when he hears about you know trace elements and yes. individual dosing, obviously. So, but should he be starting into the hobby dosing cockwasser, chasing pH at that early stage? I don't think so. I'm not because I think he, that, could he have SPS at that early 
No, that, that's not. the problem. If he's right? a new Most of them have SPS now. Well, let, let, let's 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 say so. let's ask the fish guy on a store. Your freshwater business relative to salt water, wh wh where are where are you seeing growth and or shrinkage? There's growth across both lines. Obviously, freshwater is an easier entry and a lower cost. Definitely a transition from freshwater tanks to saltwater tanks. Still, still, yeah. Which it had paused for a while, but it seems to be there again. Where there is less growth is if the planted tanks. We're talking about right. CO two and this and that. Like personally, I find them enjoyable, but like by the way, everybody people are going to do a planted tank. Beautiful. They're doing yeah, a reef tank instead. More work than a reef tank. Yeah, which <laughs> nobody understands. Like yeah. trimming a plant every week. Get the prune. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. And you get algae, it's a major, yeah. I, ha I have a tank like that, and yeah. I spend more time on that than yeah, I do the exactly. reef. But, yeah. but there's less elements to deal with, right? So they're not, they're not worrying but about traces and ICP. There is and, and there still, isn't. They're still looking at iron. You're still iron, looking at potassium. potassium. You're looking at uh, okay. nutrients. Yeah. So there are stuff that you still have to add for a plant tank. Iron, your your yeah, CO2 yeah, level, level has to be right, right with your pH. Your bubbler has to be working correctly. Yeah, there's you got to maintain your alkalinity if you're using CO2 because you're... Yeah, because otherwise it'll crash. So... But when you when you have people starting off, are they predominantly still starting off with SPS? Or are they starting with soft? Or are they starting with mixed? They're starting with mixed. So they're starting in the hardest way possible to have a mixed tank rather yes. than. <laughs> well, yeah. How many yeah. people come in and it's like their first aquarium that they want to set up is like a reef tank? Does that happen or? I it's mean, just obviously, just fresh there are areas a few. Saltwater no, fish only. Maybe. Yeah, saltwater fish only. Freshwater. Do you start them with freshwater with live rock, or how do you start them? Or salt water with live rock? No, I mean, we suggest more of like, if you're gonna do a fish tank with fate decoration stuff so you can maintain some medications, if you have problems or outbreaks or things go out of whack, so that you could manage things and then down the road you could, you know, switch over. Switch over you know, Nobody starts stuff. off right with a reef tank, no way. I mean, they do. 5%, 10%? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like when we started off, as we were talking about earlier, life was much simpler. We had metal halide lights, Kalkwasser. We did a water change on the tank. We had uh, dolomite or some other substrate or live sand, and we had good live rock. Now we have ICP testing. We look at the spectrum, the intensity, the- Paw, the pur, 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 pur. <laughs> <laughs> Every nuance in there. Do you think that is also keeping people or that they're somewhat scared because Whenever I, we started off, and we'd walk into a shop, and you said, I want to do salt water, they'd go, that's impossible, you don't want to do it. Now they tell you, you can do it, but it's really complicated. I don't know if it's better or so, not. What do you think? Challenge. We, we try to set people up back to the old school way, obviously not with metal halides, but just, you know, here's some live rock, here's some bionic, simple, right. simple and, but then we inherently get the calquas, oh, I did this, and well, right. what do I do now? It so, morphs. Yeah. So they tend to jump ahead, which tends to be the bigger problem rather than getting them started, you know? Okay. Trying to start people slow and then add, well, okay. There's a know. lot of information yeah. on the internet now. Plus, yeah. plus we yeah. had uh, live rock, like X number of pounds yeah. of live rock per good gallon. Good quality live, live good rock. Quality. Yeah. So now there's another whole interesting conversation is people starting with the dead rock and we were just talking back about uh, like, like James Pergamo has got right. a tank going where he just put in the, the artificial, that, what is it, uh, I guess a ceramic yeah. kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Took one rock from his established system, threw some slime in, and immediately put in a few acrofrags. That's it. They're doing great. And then, you know, so in other words, instead of doing the nitrification cycle and all that, he's just started, the fish went in at the very end. I think he's four months into it, but he didn't lose any frags. So that's kind of interesting, like, you know, what's really the best way to start a tank today, you know? Yeah. And that gets into, like, the freshwater gets, tank you start with plants. Right? right. Well, that also gets into what I was saying, that you're like, oh, you don't start with SPS. A lot of people are successful you're right. in the beginning with the SPS because yeah, there's right. no... Imagine I mean, you can't really go wrong with yeah. it. Cold coral, yeah, yeah. right? But you're, yeah, you're right. You could do it. Imagine if you're starting a tank, like you're saying, and you have a piece of a rock that has all the good stuff on it to get the tank cycle, and then you start one coral, two corals, one fish, two corals, one fish. Incredible. A lot of times, where I experienced from hobbyists that they do wrong is that they right away go and buy a lot of fish, right. mm -hmm. yeah. and then 
their nutrient or levels are out of control, yeah, and yeah. now they're adding corals that the corals are going to struggle because now they don't know how to control the nutrient. So I always looked at it from all the studies and experience that we've and things that we've learned through the years. If you were to introduce everything at a balance, right. your new tank, because that's another thing. When it's a new tank, you have no problem with lighting. You have no problem with flow. You have no problem with anything. Less coral, all trace less, elements, less trace all, element to light. Everything demand. is at par at a mm -hmm. perfect level, right? Um, your equipment that's removing nutrients, which is also removing a lot of these trace elements, right? Are not, you don't need as much equipment because you don't really have a lot of nutrients. So that's why I always said a new tank should always do a lot better than my tank that's 16 years old. And you don't have the a same build up sand of organic bed, stuff. Same hidden. everything, build up in, in nooks and crannies in the tank. Um, so basically I'm waiting for what they call the old tank syndrome. Basically, do does the bacteria become one type or two types or three types? So if you've lost the diversity there, have you lost the diversity in the microfauna? So is it, is it beneficial to repod your tank, re add microfauna to add to the tank, add worms to the substrate or whatever that you had when you initiated it, but 16 years later, after two or three generations, they probably died out or were eaten. There's a lot of things that may go into having the tank survive long term that we didn't even consider because mm -hmm. when we started as you know we were happy if the corals lived <laughs> we actually started with bare bottom tanks too yeah the sand Which came later we still recommend and now we're going and in the beginning still a, yeah. yeah because well you get old those sand algae beds. bottles algae yeah. battles and stuff and it's just easier old to sand the beds we, we don't know the rate that stuff's breaking White down and now bottom? versus the rate White that is bottom? accumulating you could always add sand down the road but yeah. After you've gone through an algae bloom and you've managed it, Diatone you know, bloom sand and, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's much easier to clean that up and siphon it out when it's bare bottom. And for 16 years. Now we're going Joe back Schneid. to what's old is new. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we're. We, 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 we love this topic, <laughs> Joe. Wait, wait, I'm an old wait, school wait, reefer, and I still believe it's OG the best, reefer, not old school. The best way. I still don't not sold to this new chasing. Um, all the trace elements you should chase like in the old times we kept secret certain elements that we didn't speak about how do you get that color job you know you didn't spill those beans today everything is up in the open sponges filtering water silicates um what the doc removal they? well yeah also what are they removing on what are the beneficial parts about them i mean they, they are there they're, they're filtering stuff so they can pull all kinds of things out. They're also potentially secreting compounds, you know, that are uh, engaged in turf wars in the aquarium, and that can be bad for stuff, right? So sponges are really good um, at making toxic secondary metabolites. <laughs> so it's not so right. there's, there's, you know, it's complicated. But they can um, remove the zombie the, again. They yeah, can also do that as well. So it's like, that. it's, it's, like everything else in nature, it's, it's complicated. But there are some sponges that live on the top side of the rocks oh. now, the photosynthetic ones. Oh, yep. And those are kind of like a problem, I think. They are a they little bit too, too successful. Yeah. And those sponges I'd probably try to stay away from, but yeah. the ones that are on the back sides of your rocks, um, I think that that's generally a good thing. I don't know how you get that stuff if you're starting out with. Uh, yeah, you got to get live air. Somebody Steve Tyree to buy, used to sell um, rubble with sponges. I mean, uh, back yeah. in the day, Steve Tyree used to sell them. Yeah, you he know, the cryptic, he's out of that cryptic organism. But don't don't organism. sponges I mean, I, also slough off cells that some do. corals eat, and it's yeah. a, a, another food source. They produce a massive amount of uh, some of the detritus in your tank is probably slough. Yeah, uh, sponge right. cells. If you look at it underneath the. Uh, Microscope, you'd see sponge spicules and stuff like that. No, because yeah, this is what's feeding the acros, and it was, that's what people are missing. The, yeah, the, the sponge the live food. rock. Yep. I no, but one of the things <laughs> that whenever I started off, with, <laughs> whenever I started off a tank with dead rock, one of the ways I, I couldn't get the corals to grow until I added rocks with sponges on it, cryptic sponges. And once the sponges took off, then the acros started to survive. Prior to that, no matter what I did. I couldn't get the corals to live in that rock. I, I don't know. I can remember a conversation with Steve Tyree, and I think you were involved indirectly in all this when RTN first hit. That's when yep. we were like, "There's something missing that's that could keep these things in check." 
And I think Steve's approach was sponge, cryptic things, filtering bacteria. And that's when I came out with the bromide fluoride because I think at the time there were mixes that didn't have bromide because yeah. of, we were worried about that. Thing, we right? were worried about it. We didn't that's have the we didn't have ozone. Right. That's, that's the bar I still have. Right. I'm sorry. We didn't have ICP. No. So I came up with this thing, and so Nick Craig is like, "Certainly don't need fluoride in this bar." No. <laughs> but, <laughs> but but it was but the bromide thing was interesting. Uh, it didn't cure RTN, but there was some positive effects, like anemones. Somebody got back, would get back to me, anemones did better. But I have no idea what so the levels were. Bromine. And it was a very conservative dose. It was like one part per million a week. Bromine shows up in a bunch of secondary metabolites from marine organisms. It's just like all over the place. So there's right. all kinds of brominated organics that are made. And there's no, undoubtedly they're important or else they wouldn't be making them. We don't understand exactly why they're important. But if it's not there, presumably they can't make that stuff. So right. Probably that was just a theory. Right. We were desperate. We were desperate to that make. That was like, you we know. Looking for like, something that was missing, and Steve went down the cryptic zone, which was, yep. that was brilliant in a way. Mike, let's go back to the future now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's, what's new with set of K? And I want to talk about the concoction. And you're a user. Yeah, the, the concoction is basically a old but new concept in that it's basically feeding the corals bacteria that has been, uh, for lack of a better term, stimulated and enhanced rather than just feeding it bacteria. Uh, I would love to claim that I had come up with it, but I've been following uh, what uh, Alan Vo has talked about in a couple of podcasts, and I've been doing it now for approximately three months. There are pluses and minuses to it, Corals eat bacteria. You could literally keep a coral alive 100% by feeding it bacteria, even if it's completely in the dark. If you have adequate light, corals can, that light can provide up to 70, 75% of the nutritional benefits. Bacteria, detritus, and other uh, agents provide the rest of the nutrients. So Alan Vo has taken this to a new level in working up this concoction. So what is this concoction? I'll, I'll leave it to you to look online for his podcast. But what it basically is, is a grouping of bacteria. And it's been changing and uh, it's like mutating along the way. Yeah. Know, other people find other stuff or stuff has been running out. Right. But, but I have my thing is like, what happens? It's a bunch to, of zeovit, well, vitamins. Vitamins, amino acids, bacteria, enzymes, probiotics, and a carbon source. Uh, so it's critical that you have all of these compounds. It's also critical that you have it oxygenated because if it goes anoxic or anaerobic, it produces a whole different group of things, but it doesn't particularly smell well. And you want to keep this out. Uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm using an old San Francisco Bay uh, brine, shrimp. brine shrimp hatchery. So it aerates the compound constantly. I just take off as much as I want. I do 200 milliliter batches into my into my uh, 600 gallon system. I repopulate it with clean seawater. Don't use the water from your tank because it can put in a pathogen, a carbon source, and food back to it. So it's like a food like a Benefit or a Refroids. Yeah, Refroids or Benefits or both. Or but I also use uh, Min S from Fauna Marin, and there's a couple other compounds in it that act as food that are, are very nutritious for the corals. I'm also enhancing it with amino acids and I'm starting to play with adding some trace elements to it to see if that will also expedite it. Because the thing about trace elements that we, we talked about earlier is that there isn't anything in the literature where corals take up trace elements directly. They take them up from the bacteria that they consume. So by adding the trace elements that I want to the bacteria, I'm hoping to expedite their taking those up. So this is a work in progress, as, as Alan says, he didn't note any changes until at least a month. I've been doing it three months, but I've tinkered with it and I've had, for the most part, very good results. I have had one bad result when I added way too much of this compound to my, of this concoction. I get lazy from time to time and I was leaving for four days and I said, okay, I'm gonna be gone for four days. I'm gonna dose it all at once. That was a really bad idea. I went from 10 nitrate and 0.15 phosphate to zero phosphate and 0 0.05 nitrate in two days after I dosed this. So you have to be careful. As I said, this is still in its infancy in terms of our understanding of this. How much of a batch that you make lasts how long? 
Uh, it blasts indefinitely because I keep feeding it and keep refreshing it's like it. Sourdough or something. It's, yeah, it's like a sourdough well, starter. It's not fermented. It's but my, aerobic. Yes. Have you been carbon dosing before you started this? I was carbon dosing before, and I'm still carbon dosing. Okay, so you were a carbon doser. Be because sure. before I started this, I was also dosing ammonia, which is another hot topic. I'm doing <laughs> I'm doing both because I'm always trying. He loves the fish and the corals. I like the experimenting and trying new things. That's my thing I enjoy. <laughs> So I was doing ammonia before this, uh, based on uh, Sanjay and Randy Donowitz basically saying corals consume or absorb ammonia better than they do nitrates. So rather than trying to it's bump a fact. It's yeah. a fact. It's uh, a fact. There is a paper that will dispute that. But is that right? There's always a paper that disputes. Right. Bob knows every paper to dispute anything. Yeah. I well, there is. No, there is. My, my, my in general, that's true. But some researchers yeah. have found the opposite. When really. Like, there's, it could be a, a different thing for different corals, but, but depending since, on where they're located. Since we talked the, about ammonia uh, two and a half months ago on uh, Reef Bum with Keith, I've probably talked to 100 people about it. I haven't had so, anyone tell me dosing ammonia has been horrible. So I will go with the consensus that it's been Anybody good. with fish in the tanks dosing ammonia. They're breathing it directly out. Yep. Yeah. Which is probably the biggest Lots advantage. Of fish. Lots of fish. Lots of fish. Lots but, of piss in your But a lot of a lot of these new reefer tanks do not have lots of fish. They have small amount of fish. Because they so can't then, get the then nutrients. Be, yeah. Because they're worried about the nutrients and it's difficult to get good fish. I mean it, it where I live, it's very difficult to get good fish. So in that context, I was dosing ammonia, but you got to split it up. I do four 10 milliliter doses of it a day. I screwed up once and did 40 milliliters once, and I lost one of my angel fish. So, from that, that I've had for seven years. You, after you after flew it goes, too close to the sun. You don't notice, if you do an API <laughs> ammonia kit, it doesn't go up to like 0.2 or four. No, I do, I, like I, I've done a HANA kit right after, a half an hour after, yeah. an hour after. Yeah. It's undetectable. What, what, what results you're seeing in your tank by from dosing all ammonia from all of this. From the from the ammonia, I was starting to see faster growth. More importantly, I hadn't seen Sanjay's tank for six months, and he had started dosing it three months before. And his tank was for for Sanjay's tank, it was bad. The last time I saw it, right after he had done three months of ammonia dosing, it was as spectacular as his tank had ever been, and that was the only change he had made to the tank. It's like it's like looking at your kids. When you look at your kids every day, oh, they're the same size they were five years ago. I see Sanjay's tank two or three times a year. After not seeing it for six months and then seeing, going, what the hell did you do different? The fish I, I, tank I just, owner so the, wants I've, to sell fish and not and and right. not, the, not ammonia. ammonia. <laughs> not, not necessarily, but I'm going to ask a question here. So the ammonia and the concoction. When did they go from being considered an experiment to a fad to right, a right. And also, actual uh, thing? Like well, years, years, years. Right. Yeah. but like but years, years. years. We have yeah. to reset. I, I, I'm and, not and, taunting and, anyone. Do the no, concoction. I'm, I'm, do it's the ammonia. important because some new people might just jump in. And no, start don't don't jump in and do this. This just makes it way those. too complicated. Right. So like, when does it become from an experiment? Dosing ammonia to just a fad that we right. did it for Good a year point. and it didn't go anywhere to well, this is. A new, the concoction has me very concerned because it's being done at a pH high enough that it could be where you could get pathogens, and it's not a sterile thing. The Benepets ingredient has animal fish meal in it. That itself could have some Vibrio kind of things in there. So it's an uncontrolled if bacteria. It, if it was My, now, pH. I, you guys know I've been working on a similar thing, but more fermenting, where the pH is dropping to a four. Well, no, oh, I, no the, view, the viewers don't know. know. Well, now they know. <laughs> now they know. They, they don't know watching we're the gonna, YouTube We're going to pursue this now. But, but we're going to pursue this. Bob's floor. working on the secret sauce is what he's yeah, telling you. Bob's working on the secret sauce. <laughs> Craig my, said sourdough. My, that's actually a safe fermentation because the pH. Is. Who gets who gets food poisoned it. from kimchi? We have a lot of experience with yeah. that over time. And yeah. we've, we've sort of got, got it boxed off right. into a safe corner. Whereas the other stuff that's being discussed is like... As soon as you're... Um, there's, we don't understand how that stays safe. Right, and I think there's confusion yeah. about the Introducing pH. the atmospheric I just like pathogens say. through... Right, you, you got an air stone going in, so you're pulling in any bacteria in the air. In the, yeah. but, it's like the two but, but I think there's yeah. confusion yeah. <laughs> about the pH. But the pH on a reef, yes, at a lower pH, it's been shown pathogens could be a pro you know more of a right. prevalent problem. But this is completely different. This is low pH in fermentation. It's a 4 pH. And that's how it keeps the right. That's preservation out. rather than. Right. And most of the, I'm going to go out on a limb and say probably most of the probiotic bacteria that are sold 
if you check the pH of the bottle, it's going to be pretty low, and they're probably being produced uh, anoxically or anaerobically through fermentation. So, and they're facultative. So you could put them all of a sudden in an oxygen environment. Some of these, they'll just kick right in and do something. This is basically carbon dosing on steroids. Yeah. yeah. Yes. With external. Well, gut loading bacteria with, 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 with gut stuff. Loading. Right. You're basically right. using, you're basically using <laughs> an external <laughs> system as a stomach for the corals so, externally so, and then so, adding so it. All those ingredients, they're not staying the same. But, but right, Craig? I they're being need, metabolized I might not need all and changing. So, you're so not, let's say I'm carbon dosing for 15 years and my PO4 is at 002. And now I'm doing this mess. It's a problem. It's a problem, problem for me. Yeah, it's a problem. It's a problem. So it, how, this, this is how not for is everyone. How is this not being explained to the hobbyists? Hobbyists are going to end up killing their tanks with this thing. Because an Unless you're already at 0.15 and you want to go down to 0.06. This can only work, yeah. in my opinion, for people that want to lower their nutrients. Right. It sounds like okay. a nutrient control. This is instead of dosing uh, lantanum chloride to, to, you know, let's do this, you know, mixture. Um, that's besides all Which the issues. Precise. Are you seeing a feeding response yeah. from it? Yeah, I'm seeing much more polyp extension. I'm seeing thicker polyps. And I'm seeing what looks like a, a mass below where the polyps are. What were so your could, could this be? This? Could, the, could this be done without the carbon dosing? Part of it. Well, where right. his numbers before this? My my numbers. Uh, what I try to run is a hundred to one nitrate to phosphate. Okay. So my numbers have have been roughly ten nitrate to point one phosphate. So that's ten. I call it ten to ten. No, it's a hundred. So that's one. pretty high for an SPS tank, in my opinion. Again, this is my no, opinion. But, but but it's it's within reason. One day we'll figure this out, guys. Yep. Yeah. But not today. Not today. <laughs> I want to thank all the guests. Mike, thanks for coming out. Dr. Craig, Joe, thanks Dr. You for having us. Yeah. Jonathan, who, who built this beautiful tank, and the guy that makes a lot of my products, Bob, chemist Bob Stark. In the meantime, it will be on YouTube. Hit the uh, subscribe button. Love you. Good night. Thank you. Now he's horrible, but at least Bob Stark from ESV. Uh, I noticed Pull the same up. thing. Pull that up to I, the camera. I, I noticed the same thing. This is kind of like a, this is I a, had a, a, a you a, used it. There's no literature showing that the exactly. corals are taking up the trace elements directly. It's all the bacteria. Now, Am I going to get royalties? Got, well, <laughs> that. It's uh, free salt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Craig Bigman. Adding bacteria as food to reef systems is, is something that we ought to be thinking about. Well, I've had, I had a couple of friends lose their whole tanks because the municipal water authorities changed what they were putting in, didn't tell them. Yep. You know, <laughs> That's exactly what we talked about stuff, earlier. Right.